Economics is a very, very complex um, subject, so I, I think I've probably um, put the presentation um, tonight more into, I guess, a more practical um, presentation rather than a whole lot of pie charts and bar charts and statistics and, and numbers, um, more to give you a little bit of a flavour of what we do at Perpetual and how we invest um, clients' money. Um, we're a business that's been around um, in the, the funds management area for um, over 50 years now and um, picking up on Jared's points about costs associated with accounting and, and self-managed super funds, if you put your money into our industrial share fund, it costs will all be covered. So that's, that's all you need to remember <laughs> as well. It's a, it's a good, good place to be. So what we'll take a quick look at, it's, you know, basically I've titled the presentation as a day in the life of a fund manager. Um, that also can take a lot longer than the time allotted today, but we'll, you know, gloss over a few things. Um, we'll take a quick look at our perspective on the current Australian share market and where we think everything's sort of sitting at the moment. How do we choose the quality investments that go into our portfolio? So really, you know, finding out, you know, how we go about doing our business and why we think it's a good, good option for clients. Which companies make the grade? So I'll touch on a few company stories. It doesn't mean you run out of here today and invest your life savings on the companies that I'm covering off because, you know, that we could have been on them for a while. We could be getting out of them. We could be taking some profits as well. So it becomes a bit more complex than that. What influence, influence does a fund manager have on a company that we, we might invest in and we do our little summary at the end. So let's get started. Um, everyone's a lot happier with their share portfolios. Times I've been spending talking at seminars certainly over the last five years. So we have actually seen a return to quite good markets. And when you're getting your financial reports in the mail and you're opening your envelopes, it's a lot happier story than what there was in the past. There's, in Australia, there's a pretty strong reason behind that, though. It's not um, necessarily that all these companies, companies are performing incredibly well. In fact, a lot of companies' growth has gone up exponentially in comparison to their earnings. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily going up, uh, the market's not necessarily going up based on fundamentals in a lot of ways. What we're actually seeing is cash rates have come off in the last 12 to 18 months. Everyone's looking at their term deposit rates or their fixed interest rates and going, I've got to go somewhere else. I'm going to have to take on a little bit more risk, so I'm going to put more money into the equity market. And the place that actually tends to pay those stronger dividends, so you're getting some income, is that industrial share or those defensive type of stocks. So there's a number of companies that have you know, risen in price um, and there's a lot of sectors that have gone up in price that we believe are, are pretty much at fair value at the moment, taking into account as we've got up there sort of healthcare and some of your telecommunications stocks as well. Banks as a whole, and it's really hard to, to break them down as individuals, but our Australian banks we feel at the moment are at reasonable value. Um, probably to give you a little bit of an idea of that, I've been at Perpetual, as Jared said, it's almost nine years, and we're actually underweight in relation to the index for all four banks at the moment. It's the first time it's actually occurred. So we've started to take profits in, in the banks. They're still great businesses. Uh, they're still doing what they're doing. They're still the strongest probably banks in the world. But you get to a point sometimes where you've got to start taking some profits and start investing in some companies that um, haven't witnessed that sort of growth that these businesses have. Um, we, we say they're reasonable value. We still like to be you know, well and truly invested in them because they've got that ability to provide clients with that fully franked dividend as well. Um, the issues that we're seeing are that the payout ratios that they've been applying to themselves of late are at the higher level of their, their bands. And we, with the credit sort of market softening, we can't see that those dividends are going to continue to rise over a period of time. So that's definitely one sector of the market that we're keeping an eye on at the moment. Uh, resources have rallied in the past few months as well. Um, I'd still be staying well and truly away from your penny dreadfuls. It's more your tier one mining companies. Typical examples, of course, are going to be your BHPs and your, your Rios. Uh, they're companies that are you know, low cost production, they're well diversified, and they can go back to their suppliers and cut the prices of contracts and stay you know, well, and, well and truly on top of their markets. And we're still going to be able to get some earnings out of those mining companies. 
What you need to be careful of is, um, you know, talking to the next door neighbour or your friends down at the tennis club and they say to you, hey, get onto this, this company. It's a new mining company. You've got to check it out. You know, they might not be pulling anything out of the ground as yet and you might not get your money back on those types of shares for, for quite some time. So really, it's got to be a careful space to, to look at. Cyclicals, cyclicals have underperformed over the past few years and in that basket we'll put media, retail and a lot of building companies. Um, there's a lot of great building companies as an example out there. Um, Reese is a company that you'll see every time you drive into any town, particularly regional towns, you've got Reese ba bathroom and plumbing supplies. That's a business we've been involved in for more than 12 years now. So we've actually bought a little bit more into them because we can actually see a recovery on the way in building, albeit a quite a slow recovery as well. We've bought into CSR and Borrell as well, just to give you an indication that we think there's some quality companies that are quite cheap at the moment moment and if we're sort of prepared to hang on to those companies for a period of time they'll actually repay us in spades. So we do think there's a number of strong opportunities out there amongst a market that is you know generally at fair value. But how do we find those opportunities at Perpetual? We've had a process that actually has been in place for almost 50 years. We have a, a, an investment um, team of, of 20 professionals um, who meet with about 12 to 1400 companies each and every year. So we have CEOs coming into our offices and chairmen of the board and plus our guys will go out and stand in, out in a shopping centre and you know, watch people walking around the shopping centre. Are they just buying a cappuccino and a muffin at muffin break? Or are they actually going into the shops, you know, that are owned by a Solomon Lou and, and buying stuff? So a lot of uh, work goes in, into how we go about choosing our companies. We get down to the theory. We want to invest in companies that have what we call sound management. We want the management to be ethical. We want them to do what they say they're going to do. And quite often we'll follow managers around from one business to another. So you see a manager go into a business that might be broken, they fix it up after a few years, they move on into another company and because they've got a really good track record, we'll quite often invest in that net next company that they're working with as well, as long as everything else stacks up. And the other things that need to stack up and probably the most important thing is conservative debt. If we're investing in a company, we don't want it to be highly geared. It's the highly geared companies that fall over when everything starts to go wrong in the world. We also want a business to be quality. Clearly, we're not going to invest in companies that are just complete rubbish. Everyone's going to say they invest in a quality business. One of the underlying, I guess, interpretations of that is we try to look for companies that are either monopolies or duopolies and have really um, difficult barriers of entry to get into. A little bit harder with the banks in Australia having four really strong banks, but that's what we try to apply to a whole lot of different companies. And another thing that's really important is recurring earnings, and that gets back to you know, some of those resource companies. We will only invest in a company that has returned money to shareholders for three consecutive years. Really, really important. We're going to have a company that is giving back to, to shareholders. And quite often, Perpetual will actually be agitating. We, we own a fair proportion of a lot of businesses in Australia and will agitate a lot to say, are you paying the shareholders enough? We don't want them holding too much cash you know, on their balance sheet that they could actually be sharing with their, their loyal and um, strong shareholders as well. The next steps are all about valuation and then our analysts rank the stocks from one to four and then it's up to the fund managers to actually pick the right companies, the right quantity at, at the right price. So quite a, a strong process. We never vary from that, that process. Sometimes it's tempting to invest in companies that are doing really well, but quite often that conservative debt level will, will kick them, will just kick them, kick them to the gutter. So, in our universe, where the stocks actually sort of um, pass all those filters, pass the valuation criteria, the fund manager has about 210 stocks to choose from. And out of that, just as an idea, as at the end of September, there's about 46 companies in that portfolio. But as I said, we are, you know, reaching fair value in this market and our guys will say to you, it's getting really, really hard to find new opportunities out there. We've got money to spend because people are prepared to go back into equities. What are we going to do about this? So they're constantly having to look forward to see what the, the next patterns, um, both domestically and globally, are. And what we've actually seen 
um, and we've got had a, done a lot of research on this and received a lot of research on this is that there's a massive change in Asia where you know there's massive population particularly in China going from lower class up to middle class so becoming a lot wealthier so our thoughts around that you know what sort of opportunities can we actually um, um, gain from that. So it's not our know, fund manager sitting back there having a bottle of Grange thinking this out. <laughs> um, there's actually um, potentially primary production um, areas that we can benefit from. Um, at the moment, uh, predominantly uh, lower income earners you know, in Asia and across the board, their diet has pretty much been based on an inexpensive carbohydrate diet, so rice and the like. As you get wealthier and wealthier, you start to eat different foods, a lot more protein comes into the diet. And that th means things like, you know, obviously your meats and your fishes, but also butter, cheese and milk. So if you've had any look at the papers that have recently or flicked on the radio at any point in time and caught the ABC News or whatever else it happens to be, you're hearing a bit of argy-bargy about Warrnambool Cheese Company. And there's a number of companies lining up to actually try and take that business over. And it started off with our little Bega Cheese, which is you know, pretty much a cooperative in New South Wales. They were the one that sort of started the bidding. And then other companies go, oh, didn't know they were for sale. We'll have a crack at that as well. It's attracted interest even from overseas. So at the moment, probably the companies in the, the running for Warrnambool um, cheese is Saputo, which is a Canadian company. And they look at Warrnambool and go, quality product, quality operation, and Australia is really close to Asia. That's actually a great opportunity, opportunity for us to diversify our business. So that's pushing up the prices of, of your likes of Warrnambool cheese. Bega doesn't get Warrnambool. Bega is easy to buy as well, and Saputa could come in and buy that as well. So there's those sorts of opportunities within, within those sorts of um, companies as well. So we're looking you know, definitely down that sort of primary production um, space. So cheese is awesome, love cheese. Maybe I like wine even more. So I thought we'd have a, a little look here at uh, Treasury Wine Estate, which is another stock holding we have in our portfolios at the moment. Um, Treasury Wine Estate, some of you will remember, was spun out of Foster's back in May 2011. Um, Foster's makes beer, they're not that great with wine. There's about, I think it's 50 labels that Treasury Wine Estates have in their stable, including um, Penfolds, Rosemount and Wolf Bluffs as examples. They produce about 35 million cases of wine a year. Um, and as you can see there, you know, China, they're their consumption of wine has just grown enormously over a number of years. Once again, as you get wealthier, you start to live a little bit differently. Um, and it's become becoming a consumer staple within China. I'm not sure that wine is a staple, but who am I to judge? At the moment in China, their annual consumption is about two, two bottles per capita per annum. So, not a lot. <laughs> um, as an example, to sort of put that up again, in France it's 64, bottle, 64 bottles per capita per annum, and I think they're lying. But um, they've still got a long way to go, but if you think about the population and the size of China, um, of what that it could actually grow into over time. Up until this point in, in time, it's really been the French premium wines that the Chinese have loved to drink. They love labels, they love to be wearing the, the fancy clothes and you know, eating the, the good food and, and, and having the labelled kind of wine. This is a French wine, it's the best you could possibly get. However, the Chinese government in recent times has been putting in place some austerity measures and they're trying to get rid of the extravagance, particularly out of their government departments. So it's no more French wine. So where are the Chinese turning? To Australian premium wines and Australian mass produced wines. So businesses like Treasury Wine Estates are seeing the benefit of that. Unfortunately, the Chinese don't actually like the taste of wine that much and they tend to mix good quality red wines like Grange with Coke. <laughs> <laughs> so it's great for the business. So on one hand, the, the business is going, this is fantastic, what a great opening for us. But on the other hand, they're crying because how could you possibly do that? Um, Grange, as an example, again, is responsible for about 15% of Treasury Wine Estate's revenue. and. Um, yeah, so, and they actually have a 92% margin on their wine now. So buying Grange is not good value. <laughs> they have some better opportunities out there as well. So 
Treasury wine estates is another one that we're look, uh, stock that we've invested in and we have actually invested in since it did spin out of um, Foster's a couple of years ago. So I don't know what, what it is with me but I'm going from drinking to gambling. <laughs> so that's not the perpetual way but there's, it's another good company I guess to talk about within our, in our portfolios. Um, Las Vegas, I think everybody here would put their hand up and say, yep, yeah, that's where, you know, if anyone says, where do you go to gamble? It, it's Las Vegas and I'm sure a few of you here have, um, in the room have actually been to Vegas and had a fabulous time. But the actual city now that's becoming synonymous with gambling is the city of Macau or the island of Macau, which is just off um, mainland China. So once again, it's all about this change in, in the Asian lifestyle as they become wealthier. As they become wealthier, more of a percentage of a lot of their salaries and their earnings is going to be put back into the, the gambling space. So probably something else that's not that fortunate, but it is a fact of life. Um, neither of these stocks that I'm talking about tonight, tonight being Treasury Wine Estates and Crown are in our ethical fund, but they are across a, a couple of our, our other funds. So in um, Macau, revenue growth has averaged 30% per annum for the past decade. And Macau's the place to go because um, gambling on mainland China is illegal. James Packer's Crown business is, you know, really benefiting from this. Crown, we hear about it and you see Jamie Packer and you, it's in the newspaper and whatever, and more of it's about the issues going on in Sydney on whether I'm building a, a second casino. Well, yep, sure, he wants that second casino, but at the moment, Crown actually earns 50% of its um, revenue from its operations in Macau. So, you know, and it's soaking up about 50% of the, the total revenue in Macau at the moment. So it's another good, I guess, good growth story as well. And Crown here in, um, in Australia and in Melbourne as well, they've actually changed. You've probably seen a few of the advertisements on TV in recent times where they've changed what they're doing. It's not all about the gambling and the wheel and putting money on red or black. They're trying to make it more of a destination. It's a, a place for everyone to go, just not for people who want to put money in the, in the pokies. So fabulous food, fabulous place to relax. And if you're lucky enough, you'll meet a good looking guy or, or a pretty girl. They've refurbished all the hotels in Australia that are attached to the, the casinos that um, Packer owns as well. So, you know, making it a much more stylish and more glamorous, you know, go-to destination. So he's a pretty good businessman, um, James. He surrounds himself with um, pretty good people and did learn a lot from his father. Um, and this, I guess, just supports that Australian story. You can see the difference since 1995, since, you know, from our tourist trade coming into Australia, where your UK tourists have certainly come off over a period of time and your Chinese tourists coming to, to our country have absolutely um, escalated as well. So it supports that whole growth story. Um, it's not just about gambling and alcohol. Um, a number of our banks have had a real focus on Asia as well and ANZ was pretty much the first one in there. Um, Macquarie Bank actually did some early work in the early days and it just takes a long, long time to actually get in there and make a difference. It's um, very, very hard work to do um, business in Asia. You actually have to get in there, you have to stay and you have to prove that your presence is going to be, for, be there for a long time. ANZ is the, the story we've liked for a long period of time. We think their business plan going into Asia has been very, very strong and it's actually you know, proving to be the case with 10% of their revenue now coming, coming from Asia as well. Um, CBA has gone down the branch, the branch um, path more so as well and yeah, Westpac's also having a look at some different assets as well. Probably the most pertinent um, change that we're seeing as well is that um, oh, IAG is an insurance company that we've invested in for a long time. It's always been our preference um, as an example over QBE, which a lot of people have heard about. What we like about IAG is that they own a number of different um, smaller companies that sort of sell insurance but might do a whole lot of other things as well. So NRMA as an example that everybody's probably familiar with. Um, so what we like about that company is that people just pay their insurance premiums on their caravans, their cars, their boats, their house, their content. So there's monthly cash flow coming through into a business like IAG. They're not on the sort of life insurance trauma protection kind of side. Um, now their little push into um, Asia is quite well founded as well. 
Here in Australia, we're actually really quite good, as much as we all hate it, we're actually quite good at paying insurance to, you know, protect our assets. So we will pay insurance to, you know, in case the jet ski, ski catches fire or the, you know, caravan gets a mind of its own and, and goes over the cliff edge or whatever else it happens to be. We're all very good at paying those premiums. We're really bad at life insurance, trauma protection and income protection. I'm sure the planners here would agree with that. It's really actually hard to get us to, to sign up to, to pay those sorts of premiums. In Asia, it's actually the opposite. They're very, very good at li life insurance and trauma protection and income protection, mainly because to them, education is so important. And if something happens to the main breadwinner, then their kids can't go to school. In Australia, we care more about the jet ski than the kids going to school. So, but as the, um, the lifestyle of the Asians change and they do get wealthier, they do increase their assets, there's going to be an increased need for that general insurance that we're all very good at at the moment as well. So already IAG owns 49% of Malaysia's largest general insurer. So it's a, a good company, one that we like to be, be involved in. Coming to the sort of nearing the end of my time, so I'll just tie it back to, I guess, you know, what where our top 10 holdings are at the moment, or it's at the 30th of September. Um, this can change a little bit around, and as I said before, it's the first time I've actually seen the banks underweight, but as you can see, see there, they still hold the top four positions in this particular fund. Still getting those really solid dividends. Um, and then it's pretty much a similar story with Telstra. It's probably the most hated stock in the market, but they keep on paying those dividends. So we'll take some of that. IAG I've covered up, covered off as well. ResMed's a really interesting one. Um, I don't know if anyone's aware of what ResMed's business actually is, but they um, do the, all the research, a lot of research and development of sleep apnea products, and they also do the distribution. 80% of their revenue is coming out of North America. That's where everybody seems to be having a lot of problems with, with actually sleeping. So, um, you know, what we would actually call a relatively small company, but getting larger and larger, their market capitalisation has in increased phenomenally over the last few years. So another good Aussie company showing, showing their, uh, waving the flag over um, in the States. Those last two top holdings are a couple of interesting ones which I'll touch on as well. Washington Soul Pattinson's and Brickworks. Washington Soul Pat started as a pharmacy 120 years ago in Pitt Street, Sydney, but now they're actually quite a diversified business. They're in telecoms, they're in funds management. Um, they, they've got a finger in every pie. It's also a family-owned company. The family, the Milner family owns the, they're the majority shareholders within the business. Perpetual not, is the next largest shareholder. We own about 12% of Washington Soul Pats. And that's the same for Brickworks. So Bricks, Brickworks is a company that actually has a cross ownership with Washington Soul Pats. And we own about 12% of Brickworks. This has been an interesting story that's probably been going on for about 12 or 15 months. They're both great companies. Um, the management is stubborn but sound. Quality businesses, recurring earnings, conservative debt levels, they meet absolutely anything. Perpetual actually has an, an issue with it. Um, this cross ownership I talked about was something that was set up back way in, back in the 1960s, where we had a lot of American companies trying to come into Australia and buy our businesses. And our companies weren't strong enough to fend them off. So what they would actually do is join forces with somebody else to give them a really strong balance sheet so they could fend the American companies off. And as an example, Fosters and BHP joined together at one point in time. Every one of these um, other cross ownerships has actually dissolved over the last you know, number of decades, except for this one. The problem that we have with this, that it's this ownership and there's a lot of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and a lot of accounting and a lot of taxation, but what it's actually doing is locking up what we call a lot of shareholder value. So we're trying to break up this cross ownership. The Milner family is quite quite stubborn and probably, you know, rightly so in their mind, they, they think it's a, a bad idea to dissolve it, we think it's a, a good idea to dissolve it. So there's been a lot of argy-bargy and it actually, as of today, it's gone to court <laughs> to try and, and sort the issue out, but it will be something that plays out over a long period of time. But 
to me, it just demonstrates, and it's not just with you know Washington Soul Pats and Brickworks. It de demonstrates, I guess, the power of um, a funds manager such as ourselves, who can you know stand up at an AGM or meet with management and say, look, we actually don't like what you're doing. Um, sometimes it's an easy fix. Sometimes it takes a long, long time to play out. But we are there, you know, there and prepared to stand up on behalf of our um, our shareholders. So it's a bit of a watch this space that one as well. So I'm near the end of my time. Um, so, you know, I guess the, the point of our, our presentation tonight is really in, in the time that we have that, you know, we do actually have to keep ahead of market trends, which is why we're looking at what's happening in Asia at the moment. Um, we can't just get a broker report in or look at the market going up and down going, oh, we should jump from here or jump from there because a lot of stuff has already been factored into to prices and to the, you know, what the average return of the whole market is. We, we don't want to buy the whole market. We want to buy the best companies in the market. So we always have to stay a, a step ahead. We don't jump on fads and fashions and themes. It has to be a really, really strong long-term um, trend. And we think this, this Asian century, we're calling it, will take a long time to actually play out. The headlines will always say, you know, it's China. Um, they're not buying as many resources and growth is slowing. Just to basically, it's a bad news story and it's, um, you know, let's, let's just scare everybody. But hopefully this evening you can all go, it's not all about shipping iron ore, it's about primary production as well. And we've, as Australians, have got some great opportunities to make some money out of that as well. I've put up there, um, you know, pretty much the markets at fair value, new opportunities are harder to find. And I've also put up there um, strong balance sheets. So just to finish off, we've got um, our head, head of equities down in our office in Sydney is a country boy from Armidale, New South Wales, doesn't say much at all. But what he says is always worth listening. And most of the time, through every market cycle, whether it's good, bad, ugly, flat, trending sideways, whatever else it happens to be, Matt will always say, we're at fair value. No new opportunities. I'll only invest in companies that have strong balance sheets. Three very, very important points to remember. We have another fund manager, Paul Scamvugaris, Greek guy. Can't shut him up, never stops talking, but he always finishes with exactly the same words. We're at fair value, it's hard to find new opportunities and we only invest in, in companies that have strong balance sheets. Now, obviously I'm from a funds management business. I know a lot of people love to do their own d direct share investing. I'm all for that as well. But try and remember to keep those four quality filters in mind when you are doing your own sort of direct shares as well. So that's it from me and thanks for your attention. <laughs>